Welcome to Changing the Course, Building an Anti-Racist Education. My name is Nicholas Jones, Assistant Director of Student Support and Culture here at Noble Schools. Today's episode, we're here today with Trinity, a sixth grade at Gary Coleman Middle School, Ashley Norris, the Assistant Principal here at Gary Coleman Middle School, and Jadai Hemingway, the Principal at the Gary Coleman Middle School. Ashley, Jadai, Trinity, welcome to Changing the Course. All right, so I'm excited today about this conversation. Uh, one, uh, because we are at the Gary Cole Middle School, the only middle school that Noble has out of our 18 campuses. So it's also always an opportunity to sit down and hear about the magnificent work that's going on here at the middle school. We also have a student here with us that can give a firsthand perspective on what it's like to be a student here at Gary Cole Middle School and how she's experiencing the leadership of you, Jadon, and as well as you, Ashley. But before we get into this deep conversation, we'd just love for each of you to kind of introduce yourselves What's your educated story and how did you get into education? Um, so my name is Ashley Norris Leverance. I have been in this building for 12 years. This is my 12th year in this building, um, which is a long time. And so I started as a social worker. Um, and when I was doing the work um, as a social worker, I just realized how much came from the lack of education that a lot of my clients are having. Um, I went back to school and got into education so that I could be a part of the beginning, not the end. So that's kind of what got me to education. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, so I like to say I ended up in education by accident. I'm actually not an educator by trade. So I changed um, the course of my career about 15 plus years ago. I'm aging myself. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't share that. Um, but I started my career as a DEI practitioner. So I have um, a particular lens for diversity, equity, and inclusion work that led me to education because I believe that education is a social justice issue in our country. Um, and if I can sort of help shift the narrative around what it means to be black and American and Chicagoan and from the South side, I'd rather do that with young people. Um, and so that's how I found my way into to schools. And um, yeah, I've never left and don't plan on it. Awesome, awesome. And Trinity, you are here with us. And so getting, I mean, you're sixth grade, so you're in school. So that's just why you're here with us. But while you're here, I'm sure you've been inspired and motivated to go after your dreams. Could you share with us what dreams and aspirations you have for yourself? Actually, um, my dreams are actually to like become a lawyer and to help people. Um, I mainly want to do this because before I was born, my grandma had died to a uh, to a case, mm -hmm. I don't know what the case was. My mom just said that it was like something really, really bad. So I actually want to become a lawyer so that I can, you know, help people and so I can stop what happened to my grandma to um, for other people. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. So as we think about our scope of work that we at here at Noble, uh, one of the things that we like to, we've been focusing our pockets on is our journey to becoming an anti-racist organization and with the emphasis on journey. Uh, we know that we've started, we've continued, and we've tried to apply all of our concepts and framework to our decision-making and how policies and practice kind of see themselves out over the course of the last two years. And so here we are today to talk about, more specifically, anti-racist leadership. Um, that is not synonymous to say that every place um, practices and does the things that we believe are anti-racist, but it also is when the leader of the building is able to move in this space and apply those concepts in her everyday or their everyday um, work. So we would just love, Jadon, if you could kind of talk through what it's been like to, in your anti-racist leadership journey, not only here at Gary Cole Middle School, even before you got here as well. Mm -hmm. I love that question. So I'll start by saying that I'm always fascinated by this idea of like attaching a journey to anti-racism in the ways that we don't attach a journey to anything else. So I think any kind of leadership, any kind of impact, um, is, is about a journey and that we haven't arrived on most any front um, because I think if we have, then we wouldn't still see the inequities that we see in schools that serve black and brown kids across this country. So I'll, I'll just start with, with saying that. Um, when I think about anti-racist leadership and the journey that I've been on, I, I know for sure that the first part of that journey is personal and internal. Um, as a black woman, I am not exempt from breathing in the smog around um, anti-blackness. I think every person, regardless of your identity, regardless of your background, you have internalized something that is anti-black. That is just the way we are socialized in this country. 
And so I think the first part of the journey is dealing with your own internal pieces um, that, that you need to shift. When I think about how that is then applied to a school, I think it's about making space for and inviting every person in the room who influences or makes decisions about young people into that same internal journey. So when I think about the first step I took coming into Gary Comer Middle School, I think it was really inviting us all to question to what extent we are um, living into ideals that are anti-Black, disrupting that, and then to what extent are those ideals that are internal to us playing out in the way that we carry um, our school. So I think that is the first step. I think it is internal work. I don't think Noble or any district or any organization can um, go on this journey if the people who make up that organization aren't first doing the work to attack it internally. So I'm going to pull back, fall back a little bit and kind of ask you to kind of talk a little bit more about anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about anti-racism, that's the catch word, but in some spaces, anti-racism, then people talk about anti-blackness, but that's not in all spaces. Could you, so could you just share with our audience, like when you talk about anti-blackness, what is, are you actually speaking to and what does that look like in the school space or just in society in general? Yeah, and I don't know that this is the right answer, but what I will say is for me, racism and anti-blackness are um, uh, pretty close in definition. I won't argue that they're synonymous, but I think they're, they're close. Here's why. Noble has long had a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that just means no matter who you are, no matter what your background, you are welcomed to do the work that we do for young people in this city. But anti-racism specifically calls out the way that the system of racism has impacted marginalized people. And in our context, in the schools that we serve, that is largely about how it's impacted black and brown students. So then when I think about anti-blackness and my earlier comment about how we all take in that smog, I think that we are socialized to believe that there are ways of being, there are ways of showing up, there are ways of thinking, there are ways of feeling that we attribute to black people in this country that, um, that, that we um, don't always give credit to, that we don't always affirm, that we don't always believe is appropriate. If I can give a, a finite or concrete example of that, um, one of the things I know and love most about being Black is the creative expression and the way that we sort of show up in spaces and heal spaces and, and bring our art and our wisdom and our genius to spaces. Um, and I know that our schools have not always been spaces that welcome that. So an anti-racist approach would then be to create an environment where the fullness of our children, the fullness of our people um, is welcomed and appreciated. I also don't think that to be uh, anti-racist, you have to be black. So I wanna be very um, plain about that. I think um, one of the pieces I've appreciated most about my partnership with um, Mrs. Norris and the work that we do is that we both um, unapologetically pursue anti-racism and anti-blackness in this space. And that's why we're able to create the experience that we have for our kids. So you're thinking about the belonging and the being able to actually see all the things come out. What did you all start at? Coming in and, you know, knowing that there were some areas of growth for mm -hmm. internal spaces and also for the school space in this, as a whole. Where did we start? Yeah, I, I mean, I actually, I'd love for you to jump in on this <laughs> one, too. But I, I think that the first thing is, like, if a school is not, you know, we say school should be reflective of the students that they serve. And if you look around the physical building of a school and you dig into the experiences that you're putting in front of kids, if they are not reflective of the interests, the passions, the culture, the experiences of your students, then you're actually not living that out. So I would say the first place we started after this idea of dealing with our own internalized um, biases and such was, OK, how do we create a school environment that's reflective of what our kids want? And the way you do that is you ask the kids. Uh, what it is they want. So I think that would be like one of the first ways we started on the journey. Trinity had her hand up. She raised her hand. So actually, I am actually like, I really love the school mostly because they literally like, when I first got here, I was expecting this to be the same as my old school. You know, nobody cared about us. Everybody was just like, you do you, we don't care. But this school is actually kind of different. Like, you don't have to be, you can be yourself. You don't have to be a different person. And all you really can care about, all you really have to care about is grades, 
how you're treated. You don't really have to worry about anything. Like you don't really have to worry about being discriminated for color, sexuality, anything like that. And I'm really happy about that because at my old school, um, at my old school, people used to just bully you for any like anything that was different about you. Mm. Like when I at my I re, there's some things I really enjoyed that other people at my school at my old school didn't enjoy, and I was discriminated because of it. So I'm happy like you don't have to worry about having to be somebody you're not at this mm. school. That's great. So I think um, yeah I think. Yeah, like like Trinity said, like having them be able to see themselves is where we started. I think uh, Judan came in um, and sharing their identity, didn't see herself, um, and was the first thing that we kind of started doing at the table is like, how can we make sure that they are seeing themselves? And it's nice to hear, Trinity, that you are. Um, it's really good. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, where I, or where I think we need to start it as like a white woman, I feel like it is very important that anti-racism is not anti-racist leadership, that it is anti-racism and just how I work through life. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is really important to make sure that when I'm in this building, I'm not somebody else than when I leave. Um, because I think one, kids <laughs> kids read it and see it and, and will eat you alive for it. Um, but I also think that if I am not day to day remembering what I am in this in this lived experience, how I represent myself, um, and who I can be for others in the community, um, then I'm not doing the work. And so if I'm not doing that in my day-to-day -day life, then I can't, it's not gonna be real when I'm doing it here. Um, and so I think that what we did was start with ourselves, but then making sure that staff um, were here for the commitment of anti-racism for the world, not just here at Gary Cumming Middle School. Mm -hmm. And on a day to day, what does that commitment look like? So I hear the work that you're, you're doing, the internal work, the work you've been doing over the last 15 years, the work that you've committed to doing. But how are staff and how are students experiencing your leadership um, at Gary Cole Middle School? Yeah, when, when Ashley was sharing, one of the, the I sort of had a flashback to one of our first uh, staff conversations when I took on this role. And I remember standing um, up there and plainly saying, when you choose to come to work at Gary Comer Middle School, you are choosing to come um, in service of black people and black students. And I remember you could hear a pin drop in the room because certainly what um, we, we have a diverse staff of people who come from all different backgrounds. And I think it was the first time someone had explicitly called out that the expectation is if you don't love black children, then this might not actually be the place for you and to love black children again, you can be anyone and love black people. And so I think that explicit naming in front of the staff created an invitation for us to have the hard conversations. And then we both charged and held accountable our staff members to doing the work. So we didn't pursue this idea of like, let me walk you through a DEI mm -hmm. scope and sequence. Let me have a series of, you know, anti-racist sessions on Fridays. No, we started the conversation and we said, you have a responsibility to actually do this work on your own. Um, and in our conversations with our staff members, we we often go back to and call it out just as explicitly. So I think if you were to walk up to any staff member in Gary Comer Middle School, regardless of how they identify, and you asked them what they love about black people or what they love about black students, they could unequivocally give you an answer um, because that is our expectation. What if I asked somebody and they didn't have a clear answer? Mm -hmm. How would you coach somebody through this, that commitment for themselves? And if it's like, ah, like I just like working with kids. And I know these kids are black, but I like working with kids. And I openly share that out loud. What does that mm -hmm. response look like or how are we coaching one through? I think for me, um, it's most likely probably somebody who I share the identity with. Um, and so it would be a conversation, um, just the real of it. And it kind of starts with, with what the expectation is. And I believe, I'm just gonna name the thing, like I believe that if the only time you are surrounding yourself with people of color are, are when you're in this building, then you are leaving probably more racist than you were when you weren't. So having the conversation of like, what is your life outside of this building? Um, who do you surround yourself with? What are your friends? What do they look like? Who do you go see? Who do you talk to? Um, because we believe that if you are not seeing the whole, 
than when you sit in students, you are only going to see. Because if anybody could talk about when they leave work, what do they think about in their car? It was the hardest parts of their day. That's right. And if you share my identity and the only thing that you're thinking about is how hard these students of color were when you're on your ride home, then it is only increasing it. But if you have to have lived experiences, you have to involve yourself, you have to be a part of it. And if you are not, we have to know why and what we need to do to get you there. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a real conversation. It's like, you know, if you are only here for that point, Judon has said it out loud, why are you not teaching in another school then? Because there's plenty of them that have openings. I kind of did say that. Um, <laughs> and so we're well, just real. No, well, no, Ashley's right. I mean, the conversation we had was like, gosh, the number of schools that people drive by when they yeah. drive to this one every morning, why are you here? And the fullness of that answer doesn't just have to be because I love black students, right? But a part of that answer absolutely has to be because I love black students. It reminded me of um, one of the earlier conversations we had as a team that was hard for folks or where some of this discourse came up and some of that discomfort was like put on the table was around expectations and whether or not where what we're doing in our pursuit of anti-racism, whether or not that was like lowering or challenging the, the expectation uh, for students. And so we just sit in those moments when they come up, we don't shy away from them. Uh, we don't redirect. If it takes the entire PD or whatever space we're having to have that conversation, we will. Um, and I also think we have it with our kids um, often. So we, we're just out of February, Black History Month. I would argue that probably every day in this building is, is a reflection of our, our commitment to our celebration of um, black students. And that isn't because I, as the leader of this campus, um, because I'm a black leader, it is because 99.9% .9 of the students we serve in this school and in this community, the greater Grand Crossing community, um, are, are black people. And so we have a responsibility to honor that. Trinity, you were gonna say something. So I really, I really appreciate what you're saying about like how like majority of the school is like black and we have to like lead them so we don't feel, so the kids don't feel as though like we're just here, like we yeah. don't have a sole purpose in life. And I really, I really can back that up because when I first got here and I first started meeting all the teachers, instead of like, they had open arms, like they brought me in not even knowing who I was, that was like, they were like, like, welcome, welcome to Gary Comer Middle School. Like, I'm pretty sure you're gonna love it here. I would love to have you here. And I just felt very welcomed and I felt like very, very, you know, comfortable. Even though I had, you know, I had just had got there. I felt comfortable because they're, first of all, they weren't judging me based off how I looked. Second of all, they made, they made their intentions very clear. Mm -hmm. They made their intentions very clear. They were, their intentions were pure. They did not shun me, judge me. They made me feel like I actually, you know, had, I actually had a future. I actually had like, I, I actually had all rights to be there. Mm -hmm. They made me feel like I was just welcome, a person. I wasn't different than anybody and I recommend that if anybody who who wants a school where they can be free, they can be themselves, they should come here because you don't get judged here. Teachers come in with open arms, like nobody judges you for real. It's a good school. Nobody is really nobody is really like judgmental here. None of the teachers, none of the staff, and it's like everybody in this school they came from a rough background or they or something happened to them that made them feel unwelcomed this school fixes that and i like that about it come on shameless plug mm -hmm. yeah. so i'm gonna ask you a follow-up question what about the school makes all the students feel welcome and affirmed when they come in the building well first of all nobody gets treated different nobody has favorites everybody is treated the same and another thing is Everybody, everybody, hold on, because I'm trying to think about what I'm trying to say, because the thing I'm trying to say is complicated. Okay. So technically, everybody is in one space. Everybody is black, but there's some people who, who aren't from the same religion, same space, same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Everybody is different. But this school brings everybody together as though, as though they are family as though they are someone, 
people who as though they are people who are really important because they are as people and they bring them together as black black kids of the United States of America who are really, really important and need to be seen, need to be heard, and need to be out there. Absolutely. Now, let me ask y'all, how do y'all feel sitting here listening to her, share her experience, yeah. knowing the intentionality that you all put into this space, mm -hmm. her experience, her peers' experience um, this school year? Um, I, it's, it's, it's good. Like I have been, I said, I've been in this space for a long time. I've been at Noble um, almost 12 years and um, the, the, the shift, mm -hmm. I don't think I, if you would ask me in my first eight years that I'd ever sit at a table with a student who spoke like that. Um, and so it is, um, it is hard work, mm -hmm. but it is, it's good. I got goosebumps, baby. Yeah. I got goosebumps. I was getting a little emotional too and laughing because <laughs> I think two things that um, Trinity said that are important. One is that our kids are not a monolith, right? So this idea of, of, of blackness is not a monolith. And I'm so grateful that you know that, that you can be black and, because um, that's important, important to me. So I'm excited to hear that. The other piece though, if I may, Trinity, I, I think one of the things we do in service of anti-racist leadership too, is that we start each day anew. So last week, me and Trinity, we were kind of, we, we had a moment because one of the things we know for certain is that our students are not perfect. So um, to hear Trinity, who I know has had a very nuanced and imperfect experience here, still be able to speak to the ways that it has been beneficial for her means a lot to me um, because we aren't perfect. And sometimes we don't get it right, but I think being anti-racist is also starting every day anew with that commitment and seeing Trinity or any other student every day, giving them the same respect that we gave on the first one, um, even when they or we mess up. So I ain't gonna tell our business, <laughs> you know. All right. So as you all work through the programming for this upcoming school year, how did you all gather the student voice to ensure that the programming y'all putting together is actually what they wanted? and to be a part of versus what we thought they would want or what we feel like they need. Because usually that's how it works. We sit in the room, 20 adults, and we say, we want this for our kids. This is what they need, this is what they want. But I ever sit down and talking to the kids, and one of the first things you say in our conversation was like, we actually sat down and we talked to the kids about what they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. What was that process like and what were the benefits of going through that process? Yeah, you're taking us through, mm -hmm. back through memory lane, because mm -hmm. one of the other conversations, um, that, that dropped a pin in the room right at the top of, of my tenure here was we unapologetically said that our only metric, do you remember this, Ashley? Mm -hmm. Our only metric for the first semester of last school year was student experience. And to get up, I'm an instructional leader, or at least I enter education as an instructional leader, a former teacher, right? So kids being able to achieve in reading and math, that matters a ton to me. But I also knew that like, following that path alone is actually not going to change the course of the experiences that our students were having. And so my leadership team and I made the decision that what we're gonna do is obsess over student experience first semester, period, dot. We're not gonna actually talk about like the metrics that we need to hit for academics because we believe that by focusing on student experience, we actually are going to, to move in that direction. And so we, we obsessed about it. We did our own student experience survey uh, we built a team, a data team, whose entire job was to talk about how anti-racism requires more data and not less. And we were constantly obsessing about what our students needed and wanted. Then we took that feedback from last year and completely changed our school this year. This is, in <laughs> fact, the new Gary Comer Middle School. All of our course offerings are ch were changed based on what our students wanted. We flipped our entire bell schedule and what we do on Fridays by way of what our students want is. So it isn't this surface level idea of like, okay, let's listen to kids, what they want yeah. tomorrow. It's like, actually, let's spend a, some time yep. hearing from them. Let's build our whole strategy around it. And so this year we're seeing the voices of our students play out. So before you start talking about all the good do. stuff, yeah. what were some of the things that they were saying they wanted? And like, then like, how did that translate into what we see in the new Gary yeah, they want ex they want to learn things that they want to learn, mm -hmm. right? Like I think we had a very sterile, um, um, traditional for what that's worth, like 
approach to teaching and learning. Um, and our kids wanted more than that. They wanted enrichment activities. They wanted sports and teams. I mean, we have everything from cooking to making the band. Um, and our kids love this idea of being able to have agency and voice in their day-to-day -day instructional experience. Um, and so, yeah, they didn't want more of the same. They're like, <laughs> I want to be able to do things that I am passionate about in the school day, which I think I put, up, put us up against any other school in that regard. We figured out how to bring those things, not after school, so I have to be able to have my parent, you know, not every kid can stay after school. Not every kid can come to a Saturday program. So you know what? Let's take those things that we would do um, as external opportunities. Let's bring them in the school day. And we've been able to do that, I think, really well. I don't know, Trinity. What do you think have, yes, about Trini Freedom Fridays? <laughs> so I actually really love the Fridays because, because I love what we do. Like for the first few hours of a school day, I love what we do the first few hours because you get to really test your learning abilities because we have this thing called a momentum and it's like, it's not really, it's not really, it doesn't do you by grade level. Mm -hmm. It's like, they just throw things at you, see what you can do, see it's what you can't you are, do. Yeah. See now, there was this one time where I was doing one and I had called, called my math teacher over and he was like, this is a seventh grade level. See, I'm a sixth grader. So <laughs> I, was, I was surprised because I'm like, wow, I can actually do something that's above my grade level. And then it's what we do for the last couple of hours that really just lightens up my day. Um, I'm in the program Make the Band and I can actually oh, say your team guitars over guns. I see you. Um, I can actually really say that it's actually like really really fun and it's really enjoyable because because anybody who's my friend or anybody who knows me who has known me since the beginning of the school year knows I love music. Like what do you play? Um, I play the piano. Okay. They know I absolutely love music. They know that I listen to all music tastes. Mm -hmm. Um, and the programs that you have after school, props, <laughs> just props. So you, you dropped the idea of, of Freedom Friday. Mm. Yeah. Can you talk to us yeah. more about like what Freedom Friday is, mm -hmm. how the students experience Freedom yeah. Friday? So Judon brought the idea of Freedom Friday to the table. Um, and then we just kind of had a team who put it together. And so what Freedom Friday is, is, um, it's a, sm it's a four, pe four periods instead of our normal, some classes have six, some have seven. Um, but our, it's a four period where there's two um, instructional like small groups that you'll get. So something that you need. So they'll do the, the programs are different. So everybody has math and reading. Um, but then the other two programs are literally their choices. So they got a list of what they were able to choose from. And then they picked one through three and they were guaranteed one or two. <laughs> um, and so they go in and they got to choose what they do. And so what Freedom Friday is, is those elective classes. So we have guitar over guns, we have culinary, um, we have dance, we have step, we have CPR. CPR, we have, so it's all of these things that they're interested in to be able to open the door of what they can do next. I think that is um, a big shift that we've done here at the middle school is like, what's next for you versus like, let's figure out these three years. Mm -hmm. um, and so like opening that door for them, because that is what they wanted. Like they're like, I don't know what I want to do. And so we need to be able to open the door for mm -hmm. them to figure out what they want to do. And Friday does that for them. So it's nothing to see our kids walking in the hallway with guitars on their backs or their keyboards or whatever their music instruments are or making parfaits. Yeah, they're making kebabs, that's um, <laughs> yeah, Pasta. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so we eat good on Fridays because mm -hmm. we have, we have a, a cooking class. Um, but it really was just about centering student voice yeah. and agency. The other thing I'll shout out because I know um, Mrs. Norris is, is humble and won't. Like with her having a special education background, one of the things we believe, I believe, is that every kid, regardless of, of where you are, deserves an individualized plan. So I'm proud to boast that 100% of our kids have an individualized learning plan. That's what Trinity was speaking to. So on Fridays, I actually don't sit in front of a teacher who is gonna give me the same lesson that every kid in the room gets. No, I'm focused on whatever the thing is that I need to work on or to enrich. And we do that for every kid in our building in reading and math. So our Fridays are lit. We had <laughs> lots of folks come visit. Um, and it really is just, I think it's the crowning jewel of what it has really meant to take our students' voices um, and have those shape who we are as a school. 
for the programming style, super dope. You said it's lit on Fridays. But what I, what I find the most uh, eye-catching is when you walk in the building, the images that have been put up of students, of black faces, of black and brown kids, in a light that you typically don't see walking through school spaces. Typically in school spaces, you may get a Martin Luther King mural, a Malcolm X mural, maybe a community member who's done something, the namesake of the school. But in this space, we're talking about seeing kids who look just like Trinity on our walls. And when you walk through, you see the in and throughout the building. How was that decision made? And like, who was the partner to help us come in and get these beautiful uh, murals put up around the school? Yeah, so I will start by saying one of the things we heard from our kids, so taking it back to, to this idea of student voice, is that they weren't necessarily proud of their space and proud of this this school. And um, I believe it felt confining. It felt um, diminishing. Mm -hmm. So we took on this idea of really investing in facilities. These are things that I think like school leaders don't often think about as like key levers to really changing an environment. If the lights aren't bright, <laughs> then the kids won't be um, in, terms of their in, in terms of their energies, right? And so, yeah, we um, certainly have to give credit to, to um, Noble and our facilities team coming alongside to really help us reimagine the space. Everything in this space is pretty much brand new from the floors to the lighting. We invested in local artists to come and do our murals. Uh, we have pictures of black people as superheroes, everybody from Barack Obama to Nipsey Hussle um, around the room. Anytime we have any kind of events, we are posting flyers. If you are walking through our halls and you see our displays, we got our kids up there, their recent basketball game or their birthday or whatever it is. Like there's not a place in our building where you don't see our kids. Um, and that that is intentional. How does that make you feel, Trinity, when you come in knowing that you're going to see or your version of yourself or someone that looked like you in this space? Um, it actually makes me feel really proud of my religion and my identity. Mm -hmm. I can't say that right. But it makes me really proud of both of those things because one, I know that uh, I'm worth it. I know that I am powerful. I know that I am perfect just the way I am. I know I can be proud of my skin color, proud of everything that I've been through because it makes me me. And I know that I can be proud of everybody who looks like me or who doesn't look like me because we are all people who have been through some type of, help me please, because I can't it. think of a word. I can't think of a word. Yeah, challenge, life. Who've been through some type of wrongdoings or have been through some type of pain. Like nobody is different, no matter skin color, no matter skin color, religion, sexuality. Yeah. What's dope It's like, you know, I've been in spaces and heard you, you speak and present in front of people and I'm saying, listen to, Lewis, listen to Trinity and I'm like, you said, Don, rubbing off on the kids. <laughs> You I don't know, maybe. You know they are. She is. About, so, so she absolutely she's is. She's definitely rubbing off on students and like her leadership is being seen and heard through Trinity. But I also like to turn the, turn the table and talk about you, Ashley, and, and ask you, like, how has Jadon's leadership allowed you to kind of step into this role of assistant principal as a white woman and lead the anti-racist space um, and holding people to the commitment that you all made a year ago? Yeah, I think, um, I'm just going to name the thing. I think when Jadon came, it was the first time I felt like I was seen in this network. Um, and I think that has like, that made me fight harder for a lot of years because of the same experience that a lot of our students were having. Um, and because they just weren't seen and I knew they weren't being seen. Um, and so to have somebody come in and see them for the whole that they are without any prior experience with them or anything, like I've been in the community at that point for, for nine years. Um, and I love the community, but that's nine years of, of love, right? And so Judon just walked in um, ready to love from, from jump. And I think for me, I think the biggest um, like part of mine is like making sure that I am every day remembering my identity and my privilege and things like that and using that for the students and staff that are in front of me. Um, I think that um, I started as a special education teacher here and then was, um, it used to be Dean of Culture, now Dean of Discipline, I mean, it used to be Dean of Discipline, now it was Dean of Culture. Um, and I've stepped through all of those different things and I think that, um, I think it is important to have leaders who look like our students and it is something that I always come back to 
to making sure that I am not in a spot that somebody else should be in. Mm -hmm. And I think that having Judon at the, the front of that has been able to um, has been able to allow our staff to see our students differently because they mm -hmm. see her. Um, I think that we always talk about making sure that our students have people who look like them in front of them, but I think that it's really important to have leaders who look like our students for staff that look like me mm -hmm. um, and to check that and to, to be able to see their Talk a little um, bit more goodness. about that when you get there. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that. Like, why is that um, important they, for them to see? Is it a, is they have to see a Jadon in order to see a Trinity. Yeah. And so, like, how does that work itself out in the space? Um, so I think that like, Janan's been through it in these two years. Um, she's f not in a like, just because that's who she is, she's gonna fight every day for the students. And so to be able to see um, somebody at a leadership role, fight the small fights, the big fights and all the in-between, that has been one thing that staff has seen to get the urgency of the fight. But I think that sometimes, um, like I said, if you're not surrounding yourself with people of color outside of this building, um, I think that you forget why you're here, specifically um, outside of education. And so I think Judon is, you know, Roseland from, you know, Southside, all the things. It is what, why we are here. It is the opportunities that they deserve as a student body. Um, and Judon is like the example of like all of the things for people who aren't purposely making sure that they're checking themselves in that with their student body. So we can hear your impact on Ashley and her leadership and your impact as a principal at Trinity. Well, how have you grown over the last two years as a leader in this building? How have you been challenged? How have you been pushed? And like, what do you hope to continue to work through here at Gary Coma? Yeah. This time, two years ago, I didn't know a single person in this building. And um, one of the things I'm exceptionally proud of is that everybody on my leadership team, with the exception of one person, are people who have been here for a long time. Usually when a new leader comes into a space, the leadership team turns over. I've been able to retain um, and recommit people who have given a, a, a good portion of their lives um, to this work. And so, so I'm really, really, really proud of that because the question, the next question in terms of where we go next is, I, I think Ashley could absolutely be the principal of Gary Comer Middle School. Um, because I know that her core beliefs, her ideologies, the ways that she's going to push the work forward, whether she looks like our students or not, is rooted in and centered in who they are. And so I'm grateful to have been able to be an example of that. When I think about the challenges, though, is um, school after the pandemic is hard. Our kids have a lot of needs. Our staff members have a lot of needs. And so showing up with the same vigor and passion every day, um, you know, it, it's it's taxing. It's a lot, but I, I believe that we're planting seeds that that are going to outlive us in terms of what this school continues to be in this community, um, and and who our kids are going to continue to, to be and become. Um, so the challenge makes it worth it uh, in that way. And I can't skip over this because she talked about you know the, the needs of the adults, the pandemic, the needs of students, the needs of staff. How have you all intentionally put in programming to support the needs of our students now and for our staff members who are also coming back and getting used to being back in spaces um, and need support as well? Yeah. So another one of the liberties we took, <laughs> we just did it and apologized later, is um, we started a, a pretty robust internal SEL program here at Gary Coma Middle School. So most schools in and outside of Noble um, invest in SEL programming, but they usually do that by way of some organization coming in or some facilitator coming in. We decided, let's actually test if we make this a full-time job and a full-time initiative in our building, the impact that that will have on the experiences that students are having. So we have an SEL team, a director of SEL. We have SEL specialists. We have an SEL course. We have a fully um, functioning mediation program. Um, in our space. And I think that level of investment has meant that our scholars have spaces where they can go preventatively. Um, and so that's been really important for, for our students to have spaces to talk through issues. Um, as far as staff 
are concerned. I think we've also made similar investments in their social and emotional health. This coming Friday, actually, we're having a huge uh, community event for SEL Day that is about healing. It's about restorative practice. It's about um, sessions for parents to help them understand how they can um, is it gentle parenting mm -hmm. um, and restorative parenting? So I think we've just made some really key time, talent, and treasure investments in SEL as opposed to just saying this is what we believe. We put our money where our mouth is, and I think that it's paid dividends. So hold on, can I say something really quick? Of funny? course, please. So I really, I really enjoy everything you're saying right now. I love it, and I also how you, I love how they make us feel special because before um, I love how they make us feel feel special no matter what happens because they had a day for the boys, you know, for them to heal, for them to have their day, mm. and then on the same day, just to make us feel special, on the same day for the girls, they just to make us feel special, they gave us these things that like we could care for ourselves with. And to make us just, you know, j just to have a self care day, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy how they how they do something for one person for one person, for one side of the mm -hmm. coin. Yeah, one side of the coin, but also do something for the other side, because they had a they one time they also had a day for the boys, but then I think a week later they had a field trip for the girls. And we just went out. We went to it was like this museum or something, mm -hmm. and it was technically about like how it was technically just about girls and how to care for yourself. And it was very fun. And I love how they don't really like they have they if they do one thing for somebody else for another side for like some mm -hmm. uh, like a whole different half of the school, they're gonna do something for the other side. Like, they're not like, okay, this side gets special treatment, this side doesn't. Mm -hmm. They literally give everybody the same care, same treatment, same everything. Nobody, in their eyes, nobody is, nobody is you know, better than another. Yeah. Everybody is, like, the same. Everybody is, like, everybody in their eyes is, like, you're you, but they are also them. You are you, but you are you mm -hmm. as well. You're perfect the way you are. You don't have to change. Like, they have made me feel, feel very special. And I and I feel very, like, happy about that. But they've also made other people feel... I'm so sorry. No. They've also made other people ver feel very special because everybody deserves to have that one little bit of freedom, stardom, stardom. But they also, like, love to have other people... Mm -hmm. They also love other people to just have their moment to shine, like how we have um, town halls. Town halls are like everybody who did very, very good, um, who got honor roll, high honor roll, mm -hmm. all those who had like who was a contributor, mm -hmm. safety originator. Everybody gets their moment to shine, and it's just. What do you think of our first Friday <laughs> radio station experience? Have you won yet? Have y'all won? No. Okay. We tried to win that last time, but we couldn't because no one was answering our call. Okay. No one was answering our call. <laughs> what well, is fun to like have that Julian rush, like, come on, come on, we got to do this. Yeah, let's win it. So just because I mentioned it on um, first Fridays, we... Um, to sort of bring joy into the space for adults too. Kids can help. The adults actually win the prize. So I'm DJ Hemingway and I get on the school's loudspeaker and we play a tune for all of 10 seconds. I think the last song we played was Mo Money, Mo Problems, but it could be, you know, any song. Um, and we give an extension to the office. The third caller into the office wins a uh, free lunch for their teacher. Nice. And so the kids scramble. I mean, the yeah, office phones don't ring as oh, no. ever as much as they do on first Fridays. Um, and so that's the way that we celebrate um, our adults. And then we do a parade every first Friday through the building to celebrate our cool catamounts, which are um, adults and students who we believe have thoughtfully contributed to the culture that month. So I have a question. Please. So the first time, the first time we had this thingy, um, I keep forgetting what it's called, the, the, the uh, radio thing. Yeah. Um, why didn't we have to cancel that? Which one? 
Uh, the, the very first one. Well, that's because we, we, we didn't do it right. You all couldn't hear. We got everybody in the hallway and then the loudspeakers, oh. you all were cheering too loud for your your peers. And so then when the the yeah. radio went off, nobody could hear. Nobody could hear. <laughs> we actually got the right the loudspeakers fixed after that. Too. So. Yeah, but Miss Calvin had ended up telling me I wanted it. My entire advisory went crazy. Like they would try to pick me up and take me into the um <laughs> they would try yeah, to like the put me on the show. You did win cool catamount cool first, first, first month. You were. How do you yeah. win cool catamount? Like cool catamount is technically like student of the month. It's like if you if you're a safety originator, um, goal achiever, all the stuff that, cause GCMS, yeah, it also it stands for Gary Coleman Middle School, but it also stands for G stands for goal achiever, G C T stands for um, it's okay, keep going. <laughs> I forgot what C stands for. All I know is it has something to do like with a contributor. Mm -hmm. a, a, um, contributor. I, contributor. Um, GCMS. C. M is a mindful contributor. Mm -hmm. And S is safety originator. Um, if you're all of that for that first month, for that, that month. month, you get cool count amount. And it's basically like you are like that student who was like, on top of everything, you was like, you were good, you were, you were confidence builders. Confidence builders, thank you. Yeah. You were confident in yourself, but you were also helping people, and then you were achieving your goals or helping others achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And like, it's very fun because you know that you did a good job that month, and you know that you, you know that you were like, absolutely on it top of the line <laughs> yeah and then the whole school comes out to celebrate you and they get a dance party and it's like one for each grade and one adult and then they they do the the lap yeah but like if you wouldn't like you know because my advisory absolutely went crazy like they were trying to pick me up and put me on the shelves and drag me into the um to the um room and i'm like whoa whoa <laughs> yeah they were celebrating you it was fun and then I absolutely go crazy when anybody in my advisory wins or like anybody in a different sixth grade advisory wins or like somebody I know in seventh or eighth grade wins because it's like, period, go. Yeah, right. Trini's giving me all <laughs> rave reviews. So <laughs> I don't know if y'all take on the road with you all to help her <laughs> recruit students, recruit families, but she's, she's doing a fantastic, right. fantastic right. job right. here representing right. for the student body here at Gary Cohen Middle School and really doing a great job of expressing how you are experiencing the leadership of your principal and the leadership of your assistant principal as they work really intentional to make sure you feel seen, heard, and affirmed in this space. So I want to thank you for being here with us today and sharing those experiences with us and with our audience at large. So thanks, Trinity. We're having such a fantastic conversation. I hate to kind of cut it short, but we want to get to the part of our podcast in which we talk about getting down to practice. This is our part of our podcast where we ask our guests to provide a practical tip, trick, or to all our educators listening to apply to their school environment or school community. And so we do have a student here and we've been talking about gathering student voice. So Trinity, what is one thing you would want educators to know about what it would mean to work with a black students? Uh, I kind of want them to know like, we all are different, nobody is the same because you call, you know you could have one black kid who was very quiet, another who was very loud. But one thing about them all is that they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Nobody is actually very, nobody, like none of us are as different, but none of us are the same. Mm -hmm. Because I I am a quiet, I'm a quiet, generous, crazy kid. That's real, yeah. Um, I can be crazy at times because, you know, our situation last week. There you go. But at the same time, I could also be very kind. It's just that if I get to like a point where I am very irritated, I will go off. But like there's some people, there's some black kids out there who if they get very irritated, won't say anything. They'll just mm -hmm. sit there and let it happen or they'll go to a teacher. And then there's some kids who don't handle it how I or that kid did it. There's some people out there who will literally just start throwing hands. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know that none of us are really the same. We all just have the same. None of us are really the same. We just all have the same skin color. And we all, and we all sometimes, sometimes we'll have that moment where 
we just really don't want to be talked to or don't really want to be messed with at that moment. Like if you're a friend, teacher, we understand like we can't be as disrespect we can't be as disrespectful as we were the last time or what happened before that, but we literally need like to have some space sometimes because mm -hmm. if we have space then we can stop ourselves from what had hap like what happened and we can stop from we can stop ourselves from going off. Because if she would have gave because if that person who was messing with me had mm -hmm. given me some space, I wouldn't have went off like I did. So we really just need some space when it comes to like situations like that. Yeah, one one strategy I would encourage every leader um, in a school leader to employ is what I like to call empathy interviews. Um, I think they can be leveraged both with students and with staff, and it is really sitting across from a member of your community and having a conversation about who they are, what they want, what they believe, how they feel, not in service of some other objective other than literally getting to know the other person across the table. And I think that that has proven to be one of the most um, fruitful strategies that I employ with, with students, with uh, staff members especially, and with parents that have led to really um, trusting relationships. Um, because I think far too often as leaders, we sit across from our people with an objective. Um, and so taking the time to just sit across them just to be human and to share space, um, I think is really important. I think in the same light, I think um, when it comes to student voice, actually hearing it and allow the time to figure out what's next. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times we just take student voice um, for surface level because we're supposed to hear student voice and then don't don't move with it. And so like Judon talks about it a little bit, but I feel like in this world we have created this like things must be done now and this urgency. Um, what makes us afraid to just wait and learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like she talked about like in semester one, we had SES is our only goal, but we also didn't have any benchmarks discipline wise. Uh, we didn't have anything that we came into the table th assuming. Um, we listened, we heard, and we watched, um, and then we adjusted. And so I think that any time um, an educator is, or a leader is starting to make changes that they have to, one, take the time to hear from their community. But I think they also have to realize that like those changes are gonna continue and just coming back to the table. And so when things aren't right, not um, trying to save face or whatever it is and just get down to, the, get down to it and, and fix it. Because um, I think a lot of times we just wait um, or just do it because that's what was done before um, versus like taking the time to actually what is needed in this moment now. Mm -hmm. Ashley, Jadon, Trinity, thank you for joining Changing the Course today. But before we let you all go, we ask that you look at the camera and read our final quote by Bettina Love. To love all children. We must struggle together to create schools we are taught to believe are impossible. Schools built on justice, love, joy, and anti-racism. Dr. Bettina Love. Thank you for joining Changing the Course. We appreciate you, Nick. This was good. Thank you. I love being here. This segment called Conversation After the Conversation, and which we're joined by the Jadon Human Way principal at Gary Cohen Middle School, along with two students, Dawson and Malia. Dawson and Malia, thanks for joining us today on Changing the Course. How y'all doing today? Good. That's awesome. We want to make sure that before we talk about anything else, that the audience gets the opportunity to get to know you. So Malia, would you mind sharing your grade, your advisory, and one phrase to describe yourself? Um, hi, I'm Malia. Um, I'm a seventh grade. Uh, my advisor is Mr. Smith. Um, we, that's the best advisor here. No <laughs> offense, but you know, Mr. Smith keeps us up. Um, one word to describe me, I would say outgoing. Um, my name is Dawson and I'm in Mr. Edmondson advisory. One thing to describe me is very social. So you're very outgoing and you're very social. And we heard from a classmate, Trinity, early in our conversation that talked about how Gary Coleman Middle Schools allows you all to show up and be your authentic selves. Do you feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, you're able to come in and be outgoing and be social? Yes, I agree. You agree? In what ways are you able to do that? Like, we have passing period. I walk around. We talk to each other. 
it's like no big deal. We be ourselves around people. Um, well, with me, I'm very known because of the the way I interact with people. Like, you, you, you can like if I see me, if I see that you, you're sad or something's wrong, nobody's talking to you. I'm the type I'm gonna come talk to you, mm -hmm. and I feel like that I was already like that. But coming to Gary Comer, that helped me reach and keep going to be more outgoing and like being able to show the real Malia and not being able not having to had it and like cover it up and I could just be myself here. And what allows you to be able to do that? So it sounds like it sounds like you've had some previous experiences that maybe you didn't feel like you could do that. And so being here at Gary Cohen Middle School, how what space has been created for you to be able to feel comfortable being your authentic self? Okay, so when I was younger, it was I was bullied because of because I'm dark skin, and with being dark skin, you're not the same. You're not the same shade as everybody else. So nobody wants to be your friend because you're not light or you're not the way they look. So with that being bullied growing up, it was like it was at first it was a hard thing to handle. And so when I finally stood up for myself, that's like that's when the fight has turned in. So with my previous school me being bullied stuff like that. I had to go and think, and I just had to defend myself and be aggressive so people would, you know, not mess with me or I don't, I got to act a certain way so I wouldn't get picked on. So I, I was fighting, and fighting or fighting kept building up, which led to getting expelled. Mm -hmm. So I came to Gary Comer. Gary Comer, I also came in, had my guard up thinking I was going to have to defend myself because it already happened at two schools, so why won't it happen at a third school? Completely different. They love my dark skin here. They don't make fun of it. They, I'm able to, oh, Malia, you're, you're, you're beautiful, or I can just be walking down the hallway, you're beautiful, or you're a Melanie skin. And that's from the teachers here at Gary Comer, which helped me build up the confidence mm -hmm. in what, yeah. And Dawson. What word would you use to describe your school experience um, as a student here at Gary Cohen Middle School? Um, like I said, social because in my previous school, I only went to one school. I wasn't a bad kid, but I was just some per a person that didn't talk to nobody. Like I will sit in the classroom, don't talk to nobody. This they wouldn't pick on me, but they'd try to throw some little flicks and licks at me. But when I look at them or gave them this look, they knew to leave me alone. And then when I really broke out of my shell and people seen who for really I was, mm -hmm. they seen I was funny, they seen I was outgoing, they seen I was a really fun person. Mm -hmm. And then they start all try they all started to try to be my friend. And then one person, I guess, wanted to be jealous of me. So mm -hmm. I had to defend myself in that situation. But when I came to Gary Comer, it was, at first I came for virtual, so I already knew some people here, and that's when I found my best friend. So when I got to know her during the summer, and then when we came to seventh grade, I had a lot of fun in seventh grade, because that was one of my favorite years up until school. When I was in seventh grade, I got along. We was in cohorts just still for COVID, but mm -hmm. I got along with my cohort. Me and my cohort had fun. But then when I came to eighth grade, it was just different because we got new kids. We had knew this, knew that, and I really learned for myself from the previous years from being at, um, at Gary Comer. Awesome, man. So Trinity told us a lot of cool and fun things that you all have access to here at Gary Comer Middle School, um, and she highlighted fun Freedom Fridays. Um, what's one thing that you love about Gary Comer Middle School? Um, I love that we have like teams, like that we have a dance team, we had a step team. Um, Cheer team, we have a basketball team. I like that we are um, very advanced with our sports. What about you, Malia? Well, the Gary, all, what I love about Gary Coleman Middle School, the teachers, I love the teachers. Freedom Fridays, I like that we're able to do stuff that's more connected to us. Like, we're able to choose what we're able to do instead of being told what to do. Like every other school, you'll have to be go to that class, go to this class. Mm -hmm. But here, they give us a chance to speak. They they listen. So we're able to, oh, well, I want to do this. They, they compromise. That's the word. Mm -hmm. They compromise with us. So if you 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 going to do this, but you also got to do this, so you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what Freedom Friday basically made up. 
can you give an a, a example of like, how, what would a teacher say to you? It's like, oh, we just want to do Freedom Friday. I don't want to do this thing. How would okay. they talk to you and explain to you the importance of X and Y? Okay, so Freedom, so say it's me. Okay, I'm going to use me. So um, I will ask Miss Hemingway, Miss Hemingway, let's say I just get in trouble. I got a log. A log is something. You do something, you get lost. Well, I'll say, Miss Hemingway, would I be able to go to my, um, my, First aid class on free to Friday. You're a first aid? Yeah. <laughs> you know how to do CPR? Yeah, that's what we learn. Okay. okay. And so she'll talk, she'll say, well, if you, it could be Tuesday, and I just got to block my day. Okay. Tuesday, today, if you don't get no logs today, you could go to that class for as long as you want. But if you do get another log, you can only stay there until the time. Mm -hmm. And so you, she just compromised. Like, you got to be, you got to basically give, you got to ask. And they'll give it, mm -hmm. basically. Absolutely. And Dawson, when you think about your teachers and your school community, um, if you had an opinion about something, whether it be Freedom Fridays or whether it was about mm -hmm. the way you experience a lesson, do you feel like there's an adult in this building that you could go to and express your opinion to safely? Um, I feel like every adult, like, really, all my classes I know, I'm going to have a good relationship with most of my teachers. So if I'm not feeling... The subject, if I'm not feeling how you're teaching me, I'll tell every last one of them that I don't feel like you're teaching me this way. I have told, like, previous teachers even that. And I really feel like they just need to, I don't really try to hurt them in my opinion. I just try to teach them because other kids might feel that way too. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that uh, show up? Like, after you share your opinion, do you see immediate response or is it something that you may have to repeat again or talk to another adult about your experience? Like, it's a media response because most kids will agree with me. And, like, if it's, like, like something simple, like, you going all over the place with the lesson, you're, like, going too fast with the lesson, when you tell them, they will go slow down with the lesson. So you get in the moment feedback. That's good. That's good. Can you share that same experience? If you felt like you had an opinion about a portion of the school or your school experience, you felt like you had a person that you felt safe enough to share your authentic response with. Yes. Who would that person be? Miss Hemingway. <laughs> I'll ask her and it just goes to, I'll ask her one week and the next, oh, be able to do, like, when I asked her about my hurt story when I, for February, she said, what was it? I don't remember. I was like, since everything's black history, can we do black hurt story? Black hurt story. Oh, yeah. 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 Did you see, did it happen? I don't know. She she put a word in because Miz William came and talked to me. She put a word in, which means she told somebody else that yeah. you wanted to see this happen. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So everything that you all have said has been positive. Um, and I think we are good but imperfect. I would love to hear, like, what's something, if you could change about Gary Coleman Middle School, or something you would have us do different that you haven't already said, like, what it would be? Um, one thing I would want to change is like not the behavior issues, but the way y'all do take behavior. Like I know we had behavior laws, there were demerits, but then we came behavior laws, behavior laws, but they still feel like demerits because mm -hmm. they're still going in the system. And if you get too many, you have an R3, when really y'all make it seem like it's just not detention, mm -hmm. when it kind of does feel like it. So I feel like like, mm -hmm. we behavior laws is needed, but not like to the point where it's going to affect us or showing our record. Mm. Thank you for that. Me? Um, well, me being a troubled kid and I'm always in a trouble, I feel like it's all about how you go about it. Like mm -hmm. when we get in trouble, the way you react and respond. Because it's never like what you say is always how you do it and how you say it because a child may take it another way and go tell their parent. So the, then a parent, they'll come up here thinking, oh, you being mean to my child, you bothering my child. So I feel like the discipline is necessary, but it's just all about how you go about it. Keep it in the same line of question and how we can get better. What's something that you all wish that was available to you at Gary Coleman Middle School that's not available to you now? Um... I really don't know. There's a lot available here.
you agree? That was snap to agree. So you're like, we got everything we need. We got the programming that we need. We got the people who we need to see us. We got the spaces that we need to see us. Gary Coleman Middle School is like Disneyland on, the, on South South Chicago. Can I ask another question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, do you feel like you have a fresh start every time, no matter what choices you make? Or are there ways you'd like to see us even think about how we respond after? Um, because it's my aspiration that you all feel that. It doesn't mean that, that 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 is reality. So when you make a mistake, when you don't show up as your best self, do you feel like there's an opportunity for you to have a fresh start? Yeah. Yeah. Can you say more? Um, I feel like y'all will y'all will tell us, like y'all will tell us that we're doing wrong. But like, I don't know. Because I don't know, like, what you're really trying to say. I can reword it. Like, do you feel like, um, do you feel like we see you as your best self, even in the moments when you might make a mistake? Absolutely. We could, it's, y'all don't go based off what happens in the time. Like, we build our own character. Like, we come, we show y'all, and, even if like we cannot want to talk, y'all y'all got that type of vibe, like and that feeling that's mutual. Y'all will make, like, you will make a student not want to from a student that's quiet and never talk to nobody. Don't open up. Don't say anything. Y'all, Gary Comer, the the staff, y'all make it easy for them to talk to them. Y'all are easier to talk to, which I feel like that's good because not every teacher likes to listen. And the students are comfortable. We're comfortable here. Like, even if we don't want to tell our parents something, we're comfortable with child knowing so adult will still be able to know. And if there's something wrong, y'all will still give us feedback, but also just listen, just to listen. You shared in that same experience. You feel like you had a space to be able to share the best of yourself and sometimes the worst of yourself, but also always be seen as the loving and fun, social and young man you are. Um, yes, like, for in this school, I have, um, not trying to sound negative or nothing, but I have been suspended, like, at least once time at this school. So, like, when I was suspended, I did think about it and went over it, like, and when I was in the process of getting suspended, like, Miss, I think it was Mr. Pruitt, like, when he was telling me, he said, we don't see you as just this person who just got into a law altercation, we see you as for the person that gets straight A's, the person that pay attention to the class, but the person that don't get as many behavioral laws. Like, he didn't see me for the person what just happened 20 minutes ago. He see me what was going on for the past couple months. Why is that important to you? It's important to me because I don't want people to just think I'm some person that go off on anybody, get mad, have anger issues, or just a very heated person. I want people to know that I'm a fun, generous, nice, outgoing, and authentic person. Same question for you. Why is it important for you to be able to express yourself and, and, and be seen for all of you and not just for your decisions that may, some may deem poor decisions? Well, I like to express myself. So, like, if I ever need to talk to anybody, I know that I could just come here. And, like, even if I do do something bad, I know that I can reflect on my own actions, tell them what I should have did and what I'm going to do that, to continue and to make me better mm -hmm. and be the best Malia that I can awesome. be. Awesome. Great to hear. And, Dawson, you're an eighth grader, and so your time here at the middle school is kind of wrapping up in a little while. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give your principal in order to make Gary Coleman Middle School a better place for Malia, who is going to be in eighth grade next year? Um, I would say don't give them a hard time, even though she didn't give us a hard time. But like, as eighth graders, this eighth grade class, not one of the baddest, but like one of the eighth graders that has had a little struggles through the, you know, making of coming up. But this for the next eighth grade class, like we want the I want that eighth grade class to just go smooth without there, graduate and have fun like we have been having fun. And hey, Malia, you will be eighth grader next year, leader in the building. What advice should you give Ms. Hemingway about making sure that seventh graders and the sixth graders feel seen and heard and affirmed the same as you do? 
I feel like the sixth graders that's going to seven, they they need a lot more like talking to to feel. I feel like they need to be heard more because mm-hmm. the sixth graders that are going to be seven, yeah, mm-hmm. that they need to be heard more because I feel like in my opinion, sixth graders because they're younger, so they people think oh they're not going through that much. They're children, they're children, but. With us, how seventh grade is, we able to talk to our teachers, mm-hmm. and I just want it to be the same for like they able to be open to them because, yeah, they're able to talk to them and mm-hmm. feel like they can tell how they're feeling. All right. So the last question I have for you both, and this is a pretty big question. So we just gave your principal who sit next to you some advice. So now you want to give educators across America some advice on how what they should be doing in order to be a solid relationships with black students. You can go. Um, I just feel like don't don't be rude. Treat people how treat them how you want to be treated. Always pay attention because paying attention gets you a lot of places. Um definitely um let me see. Just yeah, just make sure you're focused on yourself. Um, you can help people, but like you just want to make sure you get to the to the point that you're trying to get to. Then go back and help them. Don't get distracted. Just do you, and just yeah, just try to make a better you. Um, you're like, what training do you think? Like, we're all black kids. There's some brown, and you might see like one little black kid or a brown kid being rude to a teacher, but you don't know how that brown or black kid, girl or boy is feeling. You need to pay attention to see how they act. Like at least if they go home or like, you know, go to the youth center, at least pay attention to see how they act when they get in the car or like going home to see if they don't want to go home. So if they don't want to go home, that means it's an issue at home. And like, just pay attention more to some kids because some kids are, not wrong with them, but they're just not in the right environment. Yeah, struggling. Like they're not in the right environment in their space at home. My last question. What's an intentional thing that your teachers do to check in on your well-being? Um, Mr. Smith and Miss Tintin. Um, all in the culture team. Miss Alexander, Miss Flowers, Mr. Huntley, Mr. Moore. Yeah. I feel like they're able they they actually understand because I feel like they're younger. So with this generation, you know, we go through more. Not saying that everybody don't go through something, but it's a lot of stuff happening now. With us being black, killings, losing family members, that's that's hard. So when we need somebody to talk to, they're we're able to just go talk to them without being, oh well, that should never happen. Or if you would never did this, this would never happen. They'll just listen. And if if you're wrong, they're going to tell you if you're wrong, but it wouldn't be a pushing you away, you wrong. It's a let me help you and open arms, you wrong. Just, yeah. Yeah, like, a person that I talk to, not on a regular, but when I'm not feeling it or something done traumatic happened in my life, is Miss Williams. Mm-hmm. Because what Miss Williams does, she's not a author, she's not a, professional therapist, but she knows how to listen. So like when my grandma passed away, I came to Miss Williams. She told me, well, you know, she's in a better place, this and that, but you know, you still could love her. You know, you're still gonna miss her. You know, words, it's not gonna defend how much you miss her. Just keep your head up and keep doing this and just don't do things that your grandmother, like, you know, wouldn't let you, not wouldn't let you do, but wouldn't be proud of. So I, I just think that more, yeah, and Ms. Do. Like, we just have more people, we just need a little, little more people to um, stick up or start talking to the students more. Start talking, active listening. Yep, listening, listening skills are super important. So, Dawson and Malia, thank you for joining Changing the Course. You all did a fantastic job representing yourselves, your families in the Gary Como Middle School community. Principal Hemingway, Thank you as well again for joining and changing the course and bringing these young people to the table to have a conversation. Blessings. Thank you.